Welcome to the Smart Property Investment Show, the podcast by investors for investors. Well, how you going? It's uh, Phil Tarrant here. Hope you're well. Lots of uh, commentary coming across the airwaves uh, the last week or so. We're a week into the spring selling season, and it sounds as though it's the spring selling season that failed to launch. Uh, a lot of the commentaries around uh, it being a late spring and summer selling season as people try and work out what's going on uh, with property markets. A lot of people sitting on their hands right now, and that's really within owner-occupied uh, land, very different uh, for investors. Um, again, uh, there still be question marks around what's going to happen with interest rates. Uh, I was listening to some stuff from NAB earlier today. Uh, potential, they're saying, for something in December. I doubt it. Um, most of the mail now now uh, indicates there'll be some rate cuts um, at least the first half of next uh, calendar year. So that's January through June. So we'll watch this space. A lot of this intersection with what's going on with the political system right now. We all saw GDP growth is humdrum to say the least. Uh, the worst has been uh, for decades uh, outside of the COVID uh, period. A lot of question marks around the running of the economy. Uh, how we're going, driving forward. Uh, that said, um, probably seems to buck the trend. Uh, strong numbers across uh, the board. Uh, you'll see also a lot of commentary coming out. And you'll see it for a period of time. We'll chat about it today uh, in relation to our inability to build enough houses. Uh, I think 1.2 million houses will be built over five uh, years, uh, pointing towards um, the increased cost of constructions. I saw some numbers today that said... Um, I'll probably get this slightly wrong, but 30%, 30 percent, thirty plus percent of all uh, the cost connected with the new build is is around taxes uh, and, and other sort of fees. So um, uh, lots of handbrakes in the way to simulate uh, building activity, which will help get more Australians into properties. Uh, that said, a third of Australians uh, live in rental properties, and those rental properties are provided by property investors, people like me and you and. And the other cohort of people that tune in the Smart Property Investments Show. We like property investors. Uh, we do our bit to provide housing uh, for those Australians that do rent. The way we're structured here in Australia is that 90 plus percent of all rental accommodation is owned by individual investors. Again, people like me and you. Uh, yes, uh, there's benefits for us. We're looking for wealth creation and that's uh, a good thing. Some people do it better than others. Uh, I bring a lot of those people that do it better than others onto the show. One of them is Lachlan Vidler. He's a director of Atlas Property Group, Atlas Property Group. Yeah. Do you call it APG yet? No. I think we've probably got some collateral (laughs) that says APG somewhere. uh, APG. Yeah. Atlas Property Group. It's been going for five. A bit over four years, yeah. Four four or five years, yeah. Is it what you thought it would be? Is it what I thought it would be? Did you you start off with global domination in mind? (laughs) I don't, I don't. I don't think uh, any business owner ever thinks it's as hard as it's going to (laughs) be. I think, uh, like you said, everyone everyone probably has some idea of global domination and it's not helped by all the unicorns you see. You know, two years later, they got a billion dollar valuation and all this stuff and obviously... The business, a business like what we do, isn't really set up for evaluation like that. But I think that, um, yeah, I think uh, we're obviously here to talk about property. But I think from a business point of view, yeah, it is always so much harder. People never see the sleepless nights. People never see, you know, the the work that goes in, the extra hours in the office, the you know, the dealing with employees. It's uh, I wouldn't change it for the world. Don't get me wrong, yeah. love it, love it to death, but. It can be a bit fatiguing sometimes, right? Oh, you know? absolutely. And it takes your eye off the prize where you should be doing work, which is mm. the business that you're doing, yet caught up doing other stuff. Um, absolutely. This is the nature of the business. Business isn't for everyone. It's the reason why still like one in five businesses fail in the first oh, – sorry, what one in two businesses yeah. fail in the first couple of years, right? Absolutely. Because most people – this is a really broad and blanket statement, but most people shouldn't be a business owner. There's oh, a hot tip for you. Oh, look, to be honest, I, I would agree, and I think I, I think everybody, if they want to, they should have a go at it yeah. because I think even even a failure, like I think in Australia, we don't deal with failure really really well. Like no, I've got we a, I got a lot of mates who have spent time in the states. I think the states is probably the best place for it. If you fail there, you get a high five. Exactly, you yeah. get celebrated. It's like you know, it's oh man, congrats! Like you had a go, great job, mm. and yet. 
in Australia, we're meant to have the have a go attitude, but when you do have a go and it doesn't come off, you do end up with a lot of people behind your back sort of, you know, oh, get a load of this bloke. He, he, he failed. Like, can you believe that? <laughs> I think there's, there's different, oh, it's connected, but there's different um, shades of failure, mm. right? If you give it a crack in business mm. and, and, and you fail for whatever reason, that's okay. Give it a red hot crack. Where, where I have a problem with failure is that people really fail, right? They'll, they'll start a business, they'll overspend, mm. they'll they'll have all the trappings of a wealthy business, cars and and a A list lifestyle and all the best clubs and um, rack up huge amounts of debt, mm. huge amounts of debt to people that they owe money to, mm. you know, uh, and never pay their debts and just just go to liquidation administration. I, I I fundamentally have a problem with that. Me too. Me too. Fundamentally have a problem with that. I think I think, like you said, there's there's shades of failure. I think yeah. if you're a business owner, and and it's what it's what I do with Atlas, right? And it's mm. something we'll obviously talk about today as well. But uh, if you invest in your business, you know, if you take any any excess cash flow. And you reinvest it. You know, you you invest in people. You invest in technology. You invest in um, effectively anything to either give your employees or your customers slash clients a better experience or a better result or a better performance. Yeah. And you fail, then I think you you have done your service. You yeah. know, like you have done everything you possibly can. And yeah. And and you learn something, and maybe you start a second business and it goes yeah, well. Yeah, you may do, and, and and you need to have that scar tissue to get it right. But it's when you see the other side where people go bust, owing millions oh. and millions and millions of dollars, often to the tax office and yeah. often to their employees, yeah. whether unpaid wage and superannuation because they've they've lived some decadent life. Mm-hmm. I just sit there and just go, nah. That's that's not the shades of failure. I think is right. But what I would say, and that was a blanket statement, saying most people shouldn't go into business, right? Mm. Every single property investor is in business. They are. It's yeah. a good business, property investment. So if, you, if you're if you sitting there in your PAYG job, um, wondering what you could be or what you, you could, don't don't go and start a cake shop, right? Yeah. Like go and start a property investment portfolio. Yeah. That's, that's when you're in business and that's real business, right? You're providing, you're in the business of providing rental accommodations to people. I reckon the first hot tip of of uh, of the show today is treat your portfolio like a business. Absolutely, you know, don't don't just buy it. If you think of it like a business, yeah. doesn't mean you can't have empathy. Doesn't yeah. mean you can't be a good human. Doesn't mean you can't have, uh, you know, you can't be caring as as the media loves to talk about mm. property investors in in the opposite way. But think of it like a business. Operate it like a business. It is. Yeah. M- money money comes in, money goes out, uh, and there should be. A balance at the end of it, right? It is a business. You're on the business if you're doing it. And, and I'll give you a hot tip also, you know, to the point around, um, it's probably oh, it's probably not failure, but, you know, what one in two businesses fail, right? Mm. Property is a lot more forgiving as a business. Property investment is a lot more forgiving as a business than yeah. non-property related businesses, i.e. opening a restaurant. Most of if you open a restaurant, the likelihood of it going bust is very, very high. <laughs> <laughs> Start a property investment portfolio. Yeah, the likelihood of going bust if you just get some basic fundamentals right, it's pretty slim. Yeah, I agree. People still do go to the wall and 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 end up not working out. But uh, if you're tuning into this podcast, you're probably going down the right pathway. So <laughs> it's a big de-risking exercise. If you want a side hustle, invest in property. If you want to go into business, invest in property. Keep generating income somewhere else. Um, not to be a merchant of doom and gloom, but uh, you've kicked off Atlas. How's things going over there? What's what you're sort of you're talking about reinvesting stuff? You're mm. building new things. You're always up to something. Yeah, well, something that we've really been focusing on a lot lately is is that reinvestment. So uh, we've actually been building out from scratch, from the first line of code. You know, nothing white labeled, nothing like that. Literally from the very first line of code, uh, we've been, been building out a, an integrated technology platform. So. Uh, what, what we've done is we're bringing our clients into a bit of an Atlas uh, application ecosystem. And the first thing that we did, which uh, the, our clients can't actually use just because of our, our licensing agreements with data providers and things like that, it's for our internal use only, but clients obviously end up getting the, the byproduct benefit of it, is um, we've built out our own custom suburb research platform. So we, um, we bring in uh, individual data points um, on mass every single month. So each month we bring in about 5.3 million individual data points, right? And then in the platform we have, I think it's now over 450 million unique data points. 
And then we obviously add to that every single month. That's a lot of data points. It is a lot of data points. So I guess taking my background with, you know, um, teaching at a university and having, you know, quite a lot of education around finance and investment and property and all that, bring that all together so that we can then have a research platform that's custom built, fit for purpose. We're not trying to fit into somebody else's. And uh, we then use that to, you know, uh, find new areas, keep up to date on existing areas, um, develop research. So we're going to start releasing out our own research shortly on, you know, white papers or articles or whatever it is. But we've done that. And then the second one, which is probably about six weeks away from launching, this is one that our clients will get a much uh, better use of, uh, is we've built out our own custom portfolio modeling platform. So we're going to be able to get our clients in. It's a massive upgrade on what we currently have. And uh, we're going to be able to model out property portfolios for them so that they can then go, hey, you know, we want a passive income of this or whatever. And we can build that all out for them and then mm-hmm. use our research platform to help them then buy the properties and things like that. So, yeah, massive, massive ecosystem that we're building. Um, and the feedback we've had from our, our current clients that um, I guess have almost been like beta testers in some respect, mm-hmm. amazing. Feedback has been amazing. That's cool. Yeah. That's good. And what's going on with your podcast? Are still ticking along? Yeah. So podcast is great. So that's the uh, Property Investment Australia podcast. That's going really well. Still loving doing that. And um, and uh, I think we'll have another episode coming out. Uh, uh, oh, yeah, we, go, we go fortnightly. So I guess uh, depends when we put this one out, but, yeah, uh, but imminently. On. But, um, but I think excitingly, um, also I've uh, been working with uh, you and the team here at Momentum. And uh, towards the end of the year, uh, we're going to be bringing out another podcast uh, on the Smart Property Investment Another platform. podcast. There you go. Yeah. So Lots it'll be, of podcasts. It'll be all about, uh, yeah, we'll be, we'll be working with you guys really closely. <laughs> it's funny that. how people consume information these days. Like, you know, even a decade ago, people were still reading most of the stuff. Now they just listen, you know, and it's such a, it's such a, um, a powerful medium podcasting because you can be doing something else while tuning into it. I know a lot of tradies tune into this. Yeah. Like they'll be sitting there banging away on a work site somewhere. On, the, on their PAYG salary going, yep. oh, yeah, it's just a side hustle and property. I want to do this. <laughs> this is pretty good. So I look forward to that, mate. Um, uh, more to come in that regards. And what's your podcast called again? Property Investment Australia podcast. Available on all good podcast networks. On all good podcast platforms. Right. Absolutely. Uh, look, we're going to have a break, mate. When we come back, uh, the reason why I brought you in today, I want to talk about building generational portfolios. I've got some views around this. Oh. Welcome back. Hey, Garn, Phil Tarrant. I'm the host of Smart Property Investment Show now. I built a portfolio in property. I started about a decade ago, um, and I'm going to do an update on the Smart Property Investment Show soon of our, our property portfolio. I've sold some stuff off. I think at its peak, the, the Smart Property Investment Portfolio, for those that were familiar with that, about like, eight or nine properties in it, um, never never become positively geared. Um, it was in a growth portfolio. Uh, that same portfolio today, I did some ref- I sold some properties off, uh, which were pretty good, and sold down some other stuff. Um, the purpose of that portfolio is to tell the story on the Smart Property Investment Show, but also, you know, as a wealth creation vehicle and what we do with that in the future, who knows? Um, but I see a lot of this, Lachlan, and, and the question I have for you, is a lot of people out there talking about building positive cash flow properties in residential property, right? Yeah. Um, without any real timeline against mm. it. Like a portfolio will always become positively geared in time, if you don't increase the debt, right? <laughs> if you hold it for uh, an yeah. in, in, in definite time period, of course. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah, yeah, it will do. But, you know, most people, don't, they're not thinking like that. And, mm. and I talked about generational portfolios. So the, the immediacy, and you see it, and I think social media is to blame on this, is everyone's looking for these quick hits on on, yeah. on, on growth, right? Yeah. I You cannot, unless you're buying at 40 or 50% LVR, right? Mm. You're going to struggle to be building a positively geared portfolio quickly today. And, 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 and I'll preface that with in good quality assets. Yeah. Yeah. I would say talking strictly residential, yep. talking strictly with where rates are at today, yep. not where they were two years ago, yep. anything like that. We actually had a scenario for a client recently and it was a uh, it was an under-rented property. So that did, that did actually add into it. Um, but this client... Um, you know, like that, they had a specific need for the property we're putting in front of them, right? But the, the question got asked, how much of a deposit would I need to put down on this specific property to make it cash neutral from day one? Now, yeah. that client had a, a slightly higher interest rate, 
Um, but yeah, the, the specifics aren't too important. The, the end result was they needed to put down a 43% deposit. Yeah. Today. And that, yeah. that was literally like two weeks ago. Yeah. Right? It was 43%, right? I think as, and things I'm going to talk about today, I think we'll, we'll play into that. But um, we are at a point that will normalize again shortly, which is great. But unfortunately, something that, that I just, I, I hear so many people talk to me about is they want a result from property in in less than five years. Yeah. And the conversation I have with all of them is you can do that, right? Like our average uh, growth at an annualized level is 20%, right? You can do that, but you shouldn't go in with that perspective because if you want a short-term result, you go to an asset that has a time horizon of a shorter time horizon. Mm. Property is a longer term asset. The time horizon for a pro- for property as an asset class is plus 10 years, right? So it doesn't mean you can't, but it, you just shouldn't bring that perspective because then you bring it, you're then disappointed. Yeah. And, so, I, I, you know, I, I, I've got to call out a lot of that. And this is one of the reasons why we started the Smart Property Investment Show, to call out all the BS, Yeah. right? I remember flicking through property magazines 15 years ago and you only heard stories of like people becoming busy millionaires, right? So- <laughs> So on one hand, you've got all these people struggling to get into the market because yeah. they can't afford a deposit, right? Yeah. And to your point there, to actually have a positively geared, a positively geared one property yeah. in probably, I would imagine, a reasonable area, you need yeah. a 43% deposit. If you're in a accumulation phase of of um, investing in property, you wouldn't be putting 43% of, of the value of a property uh, in as a deposit just to make it positively geared. Of course not. And I mean, I just think some numbers on the fly here, right? Yeah, yeah. So, so for example, let's just say it was 40. I'll make the math a bit Whatever. easier in my yeah. head, right? Um, but let's say you're buying a 600K property, right? 10% of that's 60. So if you were to then go, okay, well, if I was going to put down a 20% deposit, right, that'd be 120,000. So if I was going to put down a 40, that's an extra 120. You think about it... You, you, like I had this conversation with a client and I said, I asked why that they wanted that. And, and the client said, oh, you know, I'm not going to do that. I just w- was curious. And the reason I was curious was if it was a bit shorter than, you know, maybe I'd put down 30, right? He was, he was picking a number himself, yeah. but he's saying, maybe I'd just put down a bit extra so it was neutral. And I said to him, okay, that's fine. But you've also got to think more strategically. And this is why we're here to help you do that. This client whether they put down an extra 10 to take it to 30 or they put down an extra 20 to take it to 40, they're talking about another 60 to 120,000 of cash outflow at the start to try mm. and make it zeroed. I was talking him through it and I just said, you could do that, but the reality is rates are going to drop, right? Rates are going to be dropping, whether it's next month, whether it's in six months, whether it's one drop, whether it's it's five drops, rates are not going to sit where they're going to sit, right? And that's going to make everything better. Well, NAB reckons will get to 3% in which the of the rate cycle. I, I, I would not be surprised mm. either, right? But- where this property was at, he was going to be out of pocket. Oh, I'm 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 trying to remember what the number was, but it was maybe like eight to twelve k per annum yep. after tax, right? And I said, if you go and drop even just an extra ten percent, and let's say it was twelve, right, out of pocket, you would have five years of being out of pocket before you're now paying more than what you would have on the extra deposit going in. And over the next five years, rates are not going to be where they're sitting. Yeah. So, do you want to go out of pocket now? when the time value of money says it's much better to have a dollar today than a dollar tomorrow, would you rather be out of pocket today an extra 60000 or 120000 or would you rather know that over the next five years rate, the rate movements are going to be happening and you are likely going to be back to neutral, if not positive, in probably the space of a year or two? And anyway, when I put it in those terms, you went, oh, okay, yeah, that yeah, makes a lot it. of sense. Like uh, mm-hmm. I'm taking an un... An, unneeded short-term hit when a dollar in, in my bank account is a lot better than a dollar in the bank's bank account. So, yeah. And this is why you need good advice around this stuff. But, you know, this idea of like, hey, I'm going to help you build a $100,000, $150,000 positively geared residential portfolio. Yeah. You're waiting a long time for that. Yeah. Well, and, that, and that's why most people will not build and they get stuck trying to build a generational portfolio. Yeah. And for me, the way I think of a generational portfolio is – a, to me, a generational portfolio is something that allows you to achieve your goal today, which would be either financial security or earlier retirement or something like that, and you don't need to rely on the pension and you don't need to rely on your super. Mm. You could just comfortably live off your property portfolio. And the reason that then becomes generational is because if you then hold that portfolio, as that continues to accumulate over time, that will then set up 
future generations of your family. So it doesn't mean you need to build half a million today of passive income. If you built 100 today, your kids then inherit that. They are then going to go on and ideally build off. The uh, they get the benefits of the the exactly. upside and the positive gear, exactly and, right. and and that is you know to 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 build a property portfolio to a point where you don't need to work. Yes. You know, and, and pull whatever numbers out you want. Um, you need to build a pretty big portfolio. Yes. And that at a point in time, if you pull a trigger and go, I'm now retired today, you know, to actually turn that into a positively geared thing and give you the lifestyle you've probably been keeping, you're going to have to sell some stuff down. So, you know, it's it's very hard to do unless you've been investing for 40 years, right? Uh, and and, and yeah. this, is, this, is, this is the point. So to build a generational portfolio, I think it's and, – and there's a lot of reasons why people invest in property because they go, I want to build a generational portfolio, right? Yeah. What you have at the peak is probably not going to be what you pass down to your children because you're going to need to pay yourself at some point. It's like business, right? Mm. The people that you start with are not necessarily the people that take you to the next level, right? Yeah. Your property portfolio. It's the properties that got you to a certain point may not be the properties that get you to your end point. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And it all comes down to, to asset selection. So what, why do you think most people get stuck sort of with, with poor purchasing decisions when it comes to generational por- um, property portfolios? It's a good question. I think, I think for me, um, and in this episode, I want to talk a lot about data, not, not mm. as much in this in this part, but but definitely in the next part. But for me, I think the first part, it, it sounds really simple on paper, and it is, right? But in, in practical terms, it's a lot harder. Most people get stuck because they make poor purchases, right? And ultimately, that stems from a lack of research and a lack of analysis. So then people go, okay, well, then I'll just research better. But that's, that's, that's the issue, right, is that if you're in your own echo chamber of going, I'm a smart person, I'm good, you know, I'm, I'm great at my job, I'm, I'm not dumb, I, I, can, I can read Excel, I can do all that, you, you sit in your own echo chamber thinking that it's easy to do. But yeah. if it was, then why is it 90% of people who, have a pro- who invest in property only have one or two, mm-hmm. right? So for me, the first, the first reason is that, the, that people do get stuck. And, and – you look at national markets and they tell us that, right? So that first data throughout, right, was a pretty common one done by the ABS, right? 90% of property investors only own one or two properties, right? So that's the first one. But then you go and look at, and, and I'm going to use Atlas as the example here, right? Over the last 12 months, the national property market's gone up 6.2%, right? If you go cherry pick suburbs, yep, cool. Some are up, some are, some are probably down, but we'll just use the national market change just for a, for a, for a, for a baseline, right? Mm. We've averaged almost 20% in the last 12 months. So you go, well, if you compound that in one year, our clients are now able to get into their second property. For the average person, if you bought the average property and you managed to hit that 6%, at best, just relying on, on that property growth, you're probably four years away, maybe five, because other properties have also gone up. So mm-hmm. if you're going 6%, 6%, 6%, you're going to have to get to probably 25% growth to have then beaten uh, the the other markets that are moving as well and have enough equity to then go again. So, yeah, for me, first point is people get stuck because they don't research and analyze properly and they do that because they get stuck in their own echo chamber. Yeah, and the echo chamber can, if you've got a good internal echo chamber, it can be positive. You need to be self-reflective and yeah. self-analyzing and I think it's really important, but you've got to open up your mindset as well. And and it's one of the legacies of of historically maybe how other generations have invested in property where they think you buy one property, you pay it down, right? Absolutely. A lot of people do that in property investment as well where they think, okay, I've, I've, I've saved up my dough and I've bought my first investment property. I'll save again a whole bunch of cash so I can buy my second investment property and then I'll save up again to buy my third investment property rather than moving with speed yeah. and agility through – through um extracting equity if you're buying the right properties, right? Yeah. People still do that, right? I've got a good story. Mm. Uh, so I hired a new buyer's agent uh, for the team yesterday. So it's great. We're now up to like sort of 12, 13 staff, which is amazing. Um, and, and, I, and I have this – what I do with every new employee that joins us is I take them out for lunch, right? We're, we're based here Where in – Where do you uh, take them? Take them for a schnitzel and – Quite yeah, literally. Yeah, so, yeah. We're based, so we're here in North Sydney with you guys uh, or, you know, around the corner from you guys. Yeah. So we go down the pub. Billy Barry's? I, no, no, Greenwood. Oh, we go to Greenwood. Fancy. <laughs> These guys are fancy. So yeah. literally from the very first employee that I hired through to the one that started literally yesterday, yeah. I've taken every single one on their first day for lunch. There's just a nice way to sort of sit down and, and, and get to know each other outside the sort of professional environment. Mm. 
And when we were sitting down talking, um, this new employee of mine, they were telling me, um, you know, we're just chatting about life and sort of their story and where they, and where they've come from and everything. And um, they were they, they were telling me about how um, their par- their parents come from a European background, right? And uh, the the new employee of mine uh, actually bought a, a, a commercial property, a small one, like a shared warehouse, that sort of thing, for a couple of hundred K a few years back, right? And when they were telling their parents about the fact that they were going to do that, the, the first thing their parents said was, why? Just, just pay down your mortgage. Like, why would you go and do that? Mm. And I think it just talks exactly what you, you were saying there about that mindset of different generations, different backgrounds of people as well. Yeah. Um, you know, that idea of you want to buy your own home, pay it down or buy a property and pay it down. And then you don't go for your next one until you do that. Whilst that might have been okay in, in previous times, we can be a lot smarter now, a mm. lot smarter about it. So I thought that was a good story literally yesterday. Yeah, so. no, no, I think it works. And, and, and this is what stops people buying, building a generation portfolio is this idea you need to perpetuate. Look, saving is important. Um, yes. And if you can deploy your savings, you can move faster. But you yep. also got, you know, <clears throat> one of the eighth wonders of the world, this idea of equity release, right? You know, and you can only release equity if you buy well. And let's, let's yep. remember that. Um, and I imagine one of the, the biggest misconceptions of people building general, generational portfolios, they think you need heaps of properties to create generational wealth, but you can do it with, with really smart, small asset selection. And, and, and actually what you, and I'm, I'm sort of going through a similar, similar process now of the, the properties I'm buying today yeah. are very different. <laughs> I bet they are. I bet they are. They're very, very different than the properties I was buying 10 years ago. Yeah. Like, you know, I, I, I was buying investment properties you know, in very low hundreds of thousands of dollars 10 years ago. Now I'm buying investment properties in, you know, multiple millions of dollars, right? You know, yeah. things change, right? Yeah. But but you can only do the latter if you do the former. Absolutely. So, so I'd much rather have less really good, yeah, you know, performing assets than, than heaps of, I, I, I don't want, I don't want a 70, 80 mm. property portfolio. I could have that. Yeah. I don't want that. I was, I was also going to say, before I sort of tack on the back of it, yeah. I think it's also important to note that, your purpose for buying a property like that today mm. is different to the purpose of buying a different type of property. And and I would say that I, I would certainly make the argument that in your portfolio, depending on the purpose of the purchase, there could still be the the like validity to buying a property that's worth, you know, half a mil, a quarter, a three <coughs> well, quarters but that, of that, a mil. That's what today, yeah. that, that's what there are six, six hundred thousand dollar property, right? Yeah. Which is a lot. It's a lot. Yeah, you exactly know? right. Exactly it's, right. It's a lot. So it's, it's horses yeah. for courses. But, and I still Purpose. am looking at those stuff, like yeah. to actually, for the for the right reason. Exactly. In the right it's, locations, right? And and I was only looking at my Brizzy stuff the other day, which I bought in Brizzy probably, oh, six, seven years ago, right? Back yeah. when it wasn't doing anything. Yeah, yeah. You know? And I, and I looked at some of these assets, um, uh, in areas around North Brisbane, and I was blown away by the value of them. Mm. I just went, "How did how did that happen?" Like all of them more than doubled. Yeah. Some of them are triple in value. Yeah, you know, after this period I'm, of time. I'm the same. I I, I bought a property in, in Brisbane in uh, 2018, I think it was, mm. and um, that's that's more than doubled in value since then, right? It's, yeah. What's what, what have I done to achieve that, right? Nothing. Bought at the right spot. Exactly right. You know. Yeah. <clears throat> and and I've worked. I've lived life. I've travelled. I've made money. I've lost money. I've, I've you know had nights out. I've had days in. Mm. I've you know I've done everything. And yet that's just sat in the background. And that property in what what's that? Uh, it actually doubled in in less than six years. But you know in in four or five years it, it, it doubled in value. And that was through doing nothing. Right? Yeah. And and, that's and, the power. and it's you know this is the power of generational portfolio building. Like was, I had a, there's a couple up there. I nearly sold them this time last year. Uh, to deploy the cash elsewhere, and I decided not to. Yeah, I, I got the money from somewhere else. Jeez, oh, I'm happy I didn't sell them. <laughs> I bet. Like, like, yeah. like it's. Well, I'm, I've probably got twenty, twenty some percent on them. Yeah, like a, 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 more. Yeah, absolutely. You know, um, and I'm think- just like going. Yeah, I would have been silly to have sold. It would have been a, a nice, but mm. you know, a, a, the way I went was better, and I've still got those assets, and yeah, they're doing well. So like, that, they'll be generational. And, and I think I think coming back to what you're saying before around like number of properties it's obviously different for everyone but you know i've i've i personally build every portfolio plan for every client that comes through our door right and 
through that, I've built hundreds and hundreds of plans and then more importantly, executed on hundreds and hundreds of plans for clients. And the one thing that I've sort of realized is while there's no set number for how many properties you need and, and, and all that, because it differs on where you start today and your goals and your time frame, your risk profile, uh, you know, your access to different types of credit, like there's a million different factors. Mm. A lot of people only need probably five properties. And whilst, yes, that, that's not a small number of properties, right? Yeah. I acknowledge that, that if 90% only have two, that you're already in, in the upper echelon of investors. But this is to my point of it's a long-term asset class. You don't have to buy five properties in, in five years, right? No. You could buy five properties over 12 years. You could buy five properties over 15 years. And whilst you yourself may not necessarily get the benefit of retiring at 40, or even maybe 50, maybe you do work through to 65. But then suddenly, you don't have to rely on the pension. You might have a passive income out of five properties that you end up holding of 100,000 in today's dollars plus. Yeah. You have then set up generational wealth. And, and I'll say it, it sucks, right? It sucks that you might not have got that early retirement, which so many people crave. But the retirement you do get will be exponentially better. And probably more importantly for a lot of people out there, you set your children up, you might set their ch your children's children up, yeah. and if the, if the family does well, that is quite literally how you have now set up generational wealth. To, to retire at 40, investing in property, yeah. Wild, yeah, right? Yeah, you, you'd probably not. Unless you, you know what, I will say, 20 years, right? Most plans that I build that I see and then yeah. execute on, 20 years. So if you started at 20 and you were in a semi-decent job that also had good long-term prospects. Yeah. You didn't buy your own home over that 20 years because you wouldn't be able to waste that borrowing power on, mm. on your own home. I would say that you could probably get there at 40. You probably, but it depends what your view of retirement is. And that, and there we go, right? You know, you're, you're, not, you're, not, you're, not, you're not like a, a Uber. Well, if you if you spend 20 years building a property before, and, and I'm talking like th there is some outliers there, right? Like people who maybe sold a tech business and made bazillions of dollars can, can reinvest <laughs> that in a property. Yeah. That's, that's not most no, people's- no, no. We're talking mums and dads, teachers, Yeah, that, that's cops, not most fireys, people's, whatever. Most, yeah. most people's frame of reference. Um, yeah. You know, and if you retire at 40 from building a portfolio over 20 years, yeah. like you, your retirement is not flying first class every, every no. week somewhere. It's a very probably- frugal living. Uh, uh, you, know, you probably yeah. have a nice house and you probably don't have to be anywhere, but you're not you're not throwing around money like you wouldn't believe. I would say that that would be 100K passive income, Yeah, right? So that'd be like rocking up to your job and getting your, getting 100K P. That's the average income, salary now, right? So, pretty much. So, that's right. so, yep, you wouldn't have to work. You'd get that. So obviously if you did work and you also earn 100K, well, congrats, yeah. you've just doubled your household income. But, but it's not crazy. It's but not. If, if you're 40, right? So yeah. let's say you've, you've, you've done everything you need to do and you, you're making 100 grand a year, right? Yeah. And you're retired, inverted yeah. commas. But by the way, I don't know any happy 40-year-olds who are retired. I'll, I'll just put it out there, right? Yeah. They're, they're not. Yeah. If, if, if you're able to generate the sort of money that allow you to retire by 40, you're not going to stop. You, oh, of you're, course. You're programmed, <laughs> you're programmed to do more. Like you, you I are, love you're that absolutely word. programmed. Yeah. To, to like so so I think it's a myth personally, yeah. but if you make it, if, if, I love that. I'm, if, gonna, I'm stealing that. I'm going to use that in conversation. But you program, like yeah. you just you program to yeah. make money, right? Yeah. You're not going to stop and go. That's it. And if you're making a hundred grand a year passive income on property and you're not working, yeah, you aren't sending your kids to private school. No, you're 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 you're, 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 you're struggling once every three years, yeah. if at best. You're you're, you're you're watching what you eat. You're watching where you shop. You're watching Absolutely. what you spend. Absolutely. Yeah, you know, so, so so be careful of the, the <laughs> which. But I think it also because um, I do want to talk about what's coming up next yeah, in terms yeah. of twenty twenty four. But I think I think the the thing that I'd want to just reiterate on that is a hundred k. Like let's talk, make sure we're we're we're, yeah. we're, um, we're grounding the conversation right. Yeah. The dollars I'm talking about now are in today's dollars, right? So ignore inflation. Talking about numbers in terms of today. Yeah. If you're forty and you had a hundred k passive income, right? Odds are, odds are, right? You are. You've been married for probably less than 10 years. Yep. You've got kids that are under 10 years old, mm. kid or kids under 10 years old. You are, um, you're probably still out playing in your over 35 soccer. You're, lo you know, you're, you're loving life. You're, you're, you're active. You're, you want to travel. You want to do lots of things, right? 100K to somebody in that sort of scenario is very different to somebody who is 65 or 70 
they no longer have a desire to be playing over 35 soccer because they can't run up and down. The yeah. kids are now adults and out of home. Yeah. You've experienced travel and life. And for you now, your idea of life is probably, you know, a nice dinner once a week with your with your significant other, seeing your grandkids. 100K has a different value in life Absolutely. at different stages. So. Yeah. When somebody goes, I want to build a hundred can, I like to retire by 65 or 70, I go, that is going to be perfect for you because that is already literally double the pension because a pension for a couple is about 51,000 yeah. and change. And then your use of funds is substantially different. So I think it also then comes down to where are you at in life? Because the same dollar amount has a different purpose and use. <laughs> Absolutely. Don't subscribe into the myth of property investing that you can get super rich really, really quickly and do nothing. <laughs> if, if you want to if you want to create a generational portfolio, number one, but if you want to create a comfortable retirement yeah. and you want to do it through property investment, you're going to have to work yeah. like most people up until yeah. the retirement age. Yeah. That's it's the reality for- 99% of all Australians. Absolutely. And if I'm Absolutely. bursting your bubble, <laughs> I'm sorry. What you're seeing on the internet is a myth and it's yeah. BS and it's not true. You're talking about the 1% of the 1% of the 1% yeah. that have had incredible luck. And I'm a big believer in the harder you work, the luckier you are. Yeah, agree. And it's not to denigrate anyone who has built out a significant portfolio and is doing really well, but they have had absolute fortuitous circumstances. They've taken those circumstances. They've then taken on significant risk to compound that even further. And they've basically been out of hit. You know, it's almost like the bull, the the dart that's hit the bullseye and then you've thrown another dart behind that split that first dart. Yeah. And then you've thrown a third dart that split the second one, right? It, it can happen. Yeah. But don't start investing in property or this view of building generation wealth that you, you, you're you going to be you. Maybe. And, I hope it is. And but. I think I think that's the point, right, is – Generational, reti- and generational and or retirement level wealth yeah. for most people is going to be built by whoever you are out there listing right now. Mm. You are not likely inheriting that. You are likely building that from scratch yourself. And that is an incredible achievement that you are trying to do. And it sucks that you're probably not going to be the one that gets to enjoy it at a younger stage of life. Yeah. But I, I, I'm not a parent, but I have lots of friends and family that obviously are. Mm. And uh, I, know you're, I know you're a parent, so maybe you'll agree with this. I know that for most parents, their greatest wish is that their children have a better life than them. Yeah, so. That's your idea, but you don't want to give them too much. <laughs> don't give them too big a portfolio. But, um, um, so let's talk about... So we're talking, it's September 2024, the yep. first half of the financial year, looking into, you know, the, the next six months uh, ahead of us. Um, is it a better time to build generational portfolio wealth today than what it was maybe three, four years ago, say through COVID? So I think, and I've got all the numbers and data to back me up today, right? Yeah. I think that we are basically about to enter... I, I don't know if it's better than that COVID period when people seized it, but I think that I don't want people to forget that because I believe that this period we're about to enter, and it may it may only have 12 months, right? Mm. It may only have 18 months, right? I believe that this period that we are about to enter, not last ever, of course, that would be ridiculous to say, but it could be one of the last uh, imminent periods where people can genuinely build out generational portfolios and try to do it rapidly as well, right? Okay. That's a big, bold claim. It is. It absolutely is. So so you and your boffin buddies have worked this out through what? The, the mysteries of data points and science. Well, absolutely. I mean, we've just, we just yeah. done our whole new research platform, right? So- Look, I'm, I, I don't, I'm not going to go crazy on the data. I've got yeah. a lot I want to talk about. Okay, tell me about it. All right. So- before we talk about what we're in right now and coming or coming into, I think it's important to reflect, right? I think it's really important to reflect. Coming into COVID, right, or in, in the middle of that first stage of COVID, like as it happened, mm. everybody thought that the sky was about to fall, right? Yeah. Nobody, un, nobody knew what was going to happen. It was the most recent um, global pandemic. I, I mean, what the... The, the, the closest one was probably the Spanish flu in, I think, oh, somebody's going to, I think it was like 19, 19, yeah, I was going to say 18, right, in that really early 1900s, right? Yeah. And back then, like, 
you were traveling by boat to move between countries. You didn't have technology. You didn't have social media. You didn't have the connect the connectivity that we have globally now that brings us all together. So nobody really probably understood back in those days how bad it was. But in COVID, we all understood how bad it was, and that's why we all thought that. The, at least in the early days, how bad we thought it was and that yeah. the sky was going to fall. So naturally, that created a lot of fear of of taking action because people didn't know if they were kissing loved ones for the last time. Mm. They didn't know if we were about to turn into World War Z, right? If, if anyone's seen the movie, I love that movie. It's fantastic, <laughs> right? So naturally, people were sitting back and waiting to see what happened. And then as we all now know, looking back and um, oh, there's an awesome quote, and I can't remember exactly what it is, but it's, um, you know, history, you know, history allows us to look forward. It's something, it's, it's a quote like that. But we look back and now we can go, okay, well, we were an idiot for not buying. Like if you didn't buy, you're probably sitting back going, like a conversation I have almost weekly with people. Oh my God, I, I should have bought. I can't believe it. I wasted so much opportunity. And now I'm, do, I'm doing it now because I want to, right? Let's talk some sales volume stats. Because okay. I think this helps to... Help, help build the picture, right? Sales volume, right, can help us work as, as one of the, uh, there are others, but a proxy for understanding how much demand there might be in the market, right? Because you think the more sales that are happening, it means the more people are interested effectively, right? So it's one of the many proxies that we can use to help gauge interest, right? February 2020, all right, all the data I'm going to talk about today is at an SA3 level. So uh, SA3 stands for statistical area. It's an ABS uh, grouping of suburbs. And the best way to think about it is it's almost like an LGA, right? It's probably a little bit bigger than an LGA, right? But it's SA3, okay? So all the data I'm going to talk about is at an SA3 level. So looking around the country, the average number of sales in SA3s in February 2020 was 89 in a month, okay? COVID hadn't quite hit. We'll fast forward a few months. We get to April, 55. Okay, big drop. 55, massive drop, right? Absolutely massive. Now, the next question anyone who likes data would ask is, well, uh, different suburbs have different strengths when it comes to property sales, right? Colder months, you're going to have less sales, right? Or, or you think yeah. so. Spring, that's why people always talk about spring. It's starting to get a bit warmer. Things are nice, right? You're probably going to have a few more sales, right? April, we're coming in. We've got Anzac Day. Uh, we've got Easter. It's getting colder. Mm. We're always going to be a bit lower, right? The 55 uh, average number of sales in 2020 for April was a 35% reduction on a typical number of sales that would happen in April over the previous five years before COVID, right? So that way we can get rid of any bias in that in that data, right? It was low. Mm. It was also now starting to get into the peak of the early stage of COVID yeah. where people didn't know what was happening. Yeah, yeah. Lockdowns and all that sort of exactly stuff. Exactly right. Yeah. Right. Let's now fast forward a few more months. We get to November 2020. We're out of that first stage of lockdown and people have realized that the world hasn't collapsed around us as we know it. Mm. And the property market was now starting to heat up. Okay. In November 2020, the average number of sales across all SA3s in the country was 120. Okay. So again, November, where spring, it's getting warmer, things are nice, right? Sales data can take a bit of time to flow through as well. So maybe we're talking September, October sales flowing into November. November was a 25% increase on the previous five Novembers. Yep. So we were elevated, right? Yeah. People were starting to realize what's Lots going on. Lots of transactions. On. Exactly right. <coughs> Interest rates at all-time low as well. Absolutely. So what So what does that then what, – what picture am I trying to draw here? Well, the picture I'm trying to draw is in that period, there was a lot of uncertainty. Mm. And naturally, we had some drops in demand, right? Like I said, we're using sales volume as a bit of a proxy, one of the proxies for demand. But as soon as people realized things were okay, and a key word here, sentiment yep. changed, we saw we went from 35% drops in volumes to 25% above averages, right? What's happening around us right now? We've had rates rising. People have been, you know, people have been pretty sour about it, and fair enough. Cost of living's going up. Things have not looked great economically for quite a while. Mm. But now... 
we are starting to see that sentiment is changing. And sentiment is such a big driver in the property market, right? Sentiment right now is at some of the highest levels that it has been for the last two years, right? Pretty much since the rates started increasing. Sentiments towards being able to buy property? In general. Okay. Economics, property sentiment is uh, is looking pretty good as well, but I'm just talking generally because mm. naturally if people are sad about their employment, people are sad about being able to afford groceries, people are sad about where they're going to be in holidays, it's then going to naturally translate into other areas of their life. Right? Mm. So I'm just talking generally. So we're now at some of the highest levels of sentiment in the last two years, right? So, And is that because people have now normalised the environment we operate within with higher interest rates and cost of living increases? Good question. Yeah. Yes and no. Yes, they have started to normalise it, but the media, as I'm sure people are starting to see, is starting to show a very different story, mm. right? We've seen the federal government is almost at war with the RBA right yeah. now. I've so, never seen that before. That's never seen nuts. that, right? So yeah. that is helping to shift sentiment because whilst property markets are data-driven, if it was only data, you'd be able to make mathematical models that can perfectly predict what was going to happen. Mm. But there's a reason why... It's never been able to occur, right? And it's because there are there 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 is an alpha in there, right? There is there is there is something. Sorry, it's actually not an alpha. To, I'll, 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 I'll subtract that term. There is an X in there, and that yeah. is things like sentiment and emotion. So now, almost like COVID, and that is what also happened in COVID. Sentiment dropped, and now sentiment is starting to increase, which is interesting. Uh, welcome back, Phil Tarrant with uh, Lachlan Vidler. Now, Lachlan, so you're saying sentiment is stronger today than what it was six. Also months ago, yes, it's a normalised environment. People now have accepted this is the new way it is. Yeah. So what's next? So we just talked about de- uh, sales and, and a bit of a proxy for demand, right? Well, let's talk about supply because, like anything, it's economics, right? You got supply and you got demand, right? We are continuing to experience our critical national shortage of properties. All right, everybody is aware, and I'm just going to say it: the absolute ridiculousness of the government's 1.2 million dollar yeah. houses in five years. Right, 1.2 million. 1.2 million dwellings yeah. between, and 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 this is where it gets really funny. Right, it's actually not funny. I shouldn't say that, but funny from the point of view of politicians promising things that just are never going to get delivered on. Yeah. Right. They came it's out. Been in the papers all this week. Absolutely, and that's yeah. why I'm going to I'm going to jump on. And this is why I'm talking about why I think these conditions right now are just so right. Okay, so they came out earlier this year and they set that target and they said the target was going to run from July 24 to July 29. Okay, we are in September, right? We're in the early part of September. So realistically, we've had July and we've had August. We've had two months. Mm-hmm. We are two months in. <laughs> we are two months in to their five year plan. And they've already come out and said, we're already, we're already 160,000 dwellings behind where we should be, right? In two months, we are 160,000. Percentage-wise, <coughs> we are 13% down on their target and we are two months in. Is that on the basis of them saying, if we, if we keep going at the current run rate, that's where we'll end up at the end of 2019? It, that's not an absolute number, is it's, it? No, it, it's not even based on that. They're, in their modelling, they have forecast the fact that at the back end of the five years, they're going to be up more, doing okay. more than what they are now. It is that where we are, where we should be as of right now, two months in, that's that, we are, that we, fast, we, are, we are already 13% short of that target <laughs> and we're two months in, right? So we take... The, the, the sales numbers that I was talking about before to, to talk about why that fear of inaction, how it changes so quickly once the sentiment changes, and we're already seeing that sentiment change. We've now got this shortage, right? And then to take that one step further, right, we talk about how uh, I'm trying to tie the supply and demand story together here. Yeah. Another proxy for demand is, da- is, is days on market, okay? Because you think the less time, if someone's, if someone's interested in something, they're going to buy it faster, right? Yeah. So days on market helps us understand, well, if a property sits there longer, it means that it's not as in demand, okay? Right now, the average median days on market for SA3s around the country, as of literally this month, is 49, mm. okay? So what does that mean? What that means is 60 days on market is typically a normal amount of market pressure, two months, right? You think in normal times, two months, right? You go up, you have, you know, three or four weeks of it on the market. You then have, you know, a few weeks of it sort of negotiating and blah, blah, blah. And then, yeah. and then you finally deal with it, right? 60 days on market would typically translate to just natural price growth, right? Nothing crazy, just natural increases. For the last five years, so that even includes the COVID period, we have averaged 58 days on market in a given month. Yeah. So right now we're at 49 
And in some of the craziest times of growth, we've sit, sat at an average of 58. So we're 16% lower than our current five-year average. So there's a demand there. There is massive demand. Yeah. So we've got sales volumes telling us about demand. We've got sentiment changing telling us about demand. We've got days on market lower at, at, at some of the lowest levels across our SA3s. And we're below the normal benchmarks, right? Yeah. And now let's tie this together, right? It is becoming so much harder to now buy in affordable markets, mm. all right? And the reality is most property investors are mums and dads with very typical blue or white collar jobs. They're not talking white collar of surgeons earning half a million a year. I'm talking your local accountant that might be lucky to earn 120K, mm. right? How's this for some numbers, right? Here we go. Still keeping with SA3s, right? Yeah. So to me, I've set the affordable band at about 600,000, especially where the rates are at and people's borrowing, an affordable market being about a 600,000 or lower medium price. You're talking houses or units? Or houses only. Houses. Okay. Houses only so you're right? not in Sydney. So not in Sydney, right? Yeah. So there are approximately 338 SA3s around the country. Yeah. Okay. So, so an SA3 would be Blacktown or Campbelltown, right? So, yeah. So it yeah. doesn't, like I said, like conceptually think of it similar to an LGA, so local government area. Yeah. It doesn't perfectly align with that, but just kind of thinking it's about a that. Big, yeah. big issue. Sort of exactly area, right. Yeah, the, yeah. the way the ABS sets it up is it's based on population. So from yeah. memory, I think SA3 is about 100 to 200,000 people. Yep. Um, so it, it's based on populations, yeah. right? And so you're going to get a spread of different suburbs in those areas. Exactly yeah. right. Okay, cool. All right. Sorry. So in 2020, right? there were still about 338 SA3s. In 2020, 193 out of the 338 SA3s had a median price at or below 600,000. Okay? How many is it? What was that again? It's like 193 a yeah. of 338. So I'll tell uh -huh. you the percent. Yeah. 57% of yeah. all SA3s were at or below 600,000. Okay, That's a lot. It is a lot. Where do you think it's at now? Oh, God. I reckon it's about 38%. Interesting. All right. So I'll start with last year. Yeah. So in 2023, so three, so 2020, it was 193 out of 338. 58, 50. 57%. 57. Right? In 2023, we went from having 193 yeah. to 107. Okay. So in three years... We, 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 it was a 45% reduction in three years, yeah, yeah. all right? So overall, though, so 45% reduction between 2020 and 2023, but overall, proportionally, we went from having 57% of all suburbs, we're now down to 32%. Oh, sorry, not suburbs, of, of areas, right? SA3, right? So in three years, we're now down to less than a third. Yeah, okay. 12 months later, so right now, right? I, got, I literally got this data this morning, yeah. right? In 12 months, we've gone from 107 now down to 93. Okay. So we're now at 27% of all areas around the country are in a, in a more affordable price bracket. So why is this important is probably the thread to bring it all together. Most property investors, and it's not good property investing to start with anyway, are going out and buying a million-dollar property, right? Yeah. You're going to have poor cash flow. You're probably not going to be able to afford it to start with. Yeah. It's not good property investing. Starting in the affordable markets allows you to keep scaling. It allows you to build out a portfolio, which allows you then get to generational wealth. <coughs> we have seen an absolutely enormous reduction in four years of that, all right? Now, if we tie that together, that was before COVID started, yeah. and now you see what's happened post-COVID. What's going to happen when rates start to drop, tying in all the measures that I've been talking about, we are going to, people are going to lose the ability to build that generational wealth because people aren't going to be able to afford to even buy into affordable areas to invest in. And the reason why affordability is important, and you could argue that, well, we need to change our frame of reference of what affordable is. We can say affordability is now a million dollars, but the reason why this is important is around your ability to borrow money. Exactly right. And I'm so glad you, you yeah. linked that because that is, that is the absolute frame of reference. If you can't afford to do it, you can't. And I, I guess to take it one step further... I don't have the actual number here, yeah. but that 93 also includes SA3s out in the middle of nowhere. Yeah, right? well, you won't be investing. Exactly. So of that 93, it's not actually 93 that would be investable markets either. So you're saying there's probably only about 20 to 25 probably investable markets. It could markets. be, right? Yeah. So 
as that changes, yeah, as rates decrease, cool, people can borrow more, but that is going to start to move markets. Yeah. So that's why, for me, I wanted to talk today about why this opportunity to build generational wealth, people need to seize it before it happens, right? Yeah. People need to seize it before the markets start to run because otherwise it's going to be so hard because once you've got your first property or your second property, it is so much easier. But yeah. if you haven't even got your first or your second, the data's here. The numbers are showing us, right? That's, and this data, literally, I, I, I collected it all this morning to make it as accurate as possible. So, so I guess as part of your thesis then, you're saying, well, affordability, the frame of reference of affordability won't change because affordable is what most people can borrow. Yeah, average, median, average, average whatever, median, whatever metric you'd like to yeah. use. Uh, the other aspect of it is they're not building any more. They're not building enough properties, so there's not going to be a huge glut of properties out there which will which will change the the, the price of um absolutely uh, property. So so I would argue then that if you're ever going to get started in property, now's the time to start because this is how to to the point being if you can get two really good assets quickly and get that huge injection of capital growth, which is how I started yeah the smart property portfolio just got big rapid right place right time yeah affordable absolutely. markets right place right time absolutely western suburbs of Sydney in 2020, 2012, 2013, right? Arguably you know, some of the best buyers that, that has been around. So you're saying that those, it won't be in Sydney, by the way, but you're saying <laughs> yeah. that those markets do exist now. Of, absolutely they do. Yeah. And I mean, obviously, and, and, and I want to make it really clear, this is not a pitch to come and work with us, right? Obviously, I'm going to say, if you want to do this, we will help you. But this is yeah. not a pitch about that. This is about making sure that people understand that if you are sitting on the fence, if you are not sure, if you're thinking, oh, I'll wait till I, the market starts to move, you, you, you can't do that. Yeah. Like the, the data is here. That's what I've taken everybody through today. It is going to disappear over a very short time period. Yeah, and, and, and what will happen is that as soon as you start getting interest rate cuts, it's going to accelerate this and absolutely rapidly. It is. Absolutely. It's going to be a huge accelerator of it. Uh, very, so what do you do about it then if you want to sort of start using this as a moment in time to create generational wealth through property investment? Well, I think the first thing you need to do is you, you need to look at your position right now, right? Mm. So that's look at where your savings are at. Look at where you, maybe if you own your own home, do you have equity in that? You know, go and talk with a broker, go and talk with your accountant. If you don't need to do that and you're comfortable with your own ability to assess, do that, right? Yeah. But you need to go and assess, okay? Then you need to just go out and do, right? Research and analysis, it has never been more important. I've, I've spoken about the stats, you know, we're, we're talking about today, right? Poor poor location choice and poor asset selection that comes from bad research and bad analysis mm. that comes from, you know, I guess this is where I will say it, right? If we've got 450 million data points, how can you possibly think that you can compete with us? Yeah. And that's not trying to be cocky. That's just being, that's just being practical, right? If we have 450 million data points and we get over 5 million a month, how are you going to be able to beat us when it comes to re uh, researching locations, analyzing markets, pulling the trigger, buying good properties, buying under market, having relationships with agents, if you can do it, great, go do it, right? Send me an email and say that you did it. That's amazing. I'm so, I am genuinely so happy for you. But if you can't, don't be too proud to get help, whether it's from me or somebody else. Yeah. I'd, I'd also, to give it a different view of that, yeah, do it yourself. Great. Cool. But you might not do it as quickly. Well, that's it. If you buy poorly, you might not scale. Yeah. And if you can't scale, it's not a you might not, it's you will not yeah. create generational it's, wealth. It's, it's about, you know, speed, right? Like the, the sooner, like most property investment, particularly, the, the uh, you know, I, I, I can't form, like I've heard the numbers and I can't yet form my position on it, but taking what you're saying at face value is that you want to move pretty quickly, decisively. Absolutely. And, or you can sit there and spend nine months analysing the data yourself and, and coming to the same conclusion, but you've lost nine months of potential Upside capital growth. So this is what it's it's this is about a you know, opportunity cost. So so if people want to chat with you guys, what do they do, Lachlan? If you want to have a chat, come over atlaspropertygroup.com.au. Come and have a chat with uh, with myself and the team. Chicken stitch all for every new customer at the Greenwood. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. oh, I'm sure the staff yeah. will love that one. Uh, but yeah, look, come and have a chat. Right at the end of the day, your first step is is to have a chat. Okay, and it doesn't mean that we can help you, and it doesn't mean that we're going to be a great fit for you. But what I can say is. We, have, we do great results, right? It's why we've been REB finals for Buyers Asian of the Year for yeah. the last, I think, three or four years in a row. It's on again soon. It is February. on again soon. You're going to have sure. another crack? Absolutely. Maybe yeah. we'll, we'll, we'll go for the W this year. Right. Uh, but 
take action. Come and have a chat with us, atlaspropertygroup.com.au. We are here to help you. You can take advantage of our 450 million data points that's growing every month. Take advantage of our portfolio modeling. Let us help you build that generational wealth. Good one. All right, nice. So well considered, Lachlan. It's good to see you digging down in the numbers. And it's a lot of clues in the numbers. The numbers can be a really good guiding element of creating a holistic view and, and an approach, both strategically and tactically, how you invest in property. But it's not just the data. Uh, the data will tell you potentially where you need to be, but then you still need the skills and capabilities to go and find those assets. And uh, there's no secrets with this. Other people are going to interpret the data and they're probably going to be finding the same things as well. So there'll be competition out there. But uh, Lachlan Vidler, thanks for coming. Right. Thanks for having me, Phil. Until um, next time. Yeah, nice one. Thanks uh, thanks for tuning in, everyone. Remember, smartpropertyinvestment.com, new social media, smartpropertyhq. Please, reviews on uh, the podcast channel, wherever you're tuning into this. Um, our team get a real kick out of it. Uh, we'd like to see more there. So if, if you like what we're doing, it'll take you one second to give us a five-star review and some comments there. Uh, that'd be really handy. Uh, we'll see you again next time. Until then, bye-bye. The information featured in this podcast is general in nature and does not take into consideration your financial situation or individual needs and should not be relied upon. Before making any investment, insurance, tax, property or financial planning decision, you should consult a licensed professional who can advise whether your decision is appropriate for you. Guests appearing on this podcast may have a commercial relationship with the companies mentioned.